So we heard a lot about uh, risk, risk of uh, science and technology, and that is one thing I'm going to uh, talk about. So actually, I want to present one uh, instrument that I think we really need for management of those kinds of risks, and that is indeed liability as well. Said. And I will present uh, to you a uh, European piece of legislation that I think is really important uh, in that respect. I think you really need to know about. That's one thing that I want to say something about the topic of responsibility of uh, scientists, as you are. So, given all the things that are presented, have been presented here, what is your responsibility in those things? And as a part of that, of that responsibility, uh, and that's my third topic, I want to briefly present the example, one of the examples that was mentioned already by Mr. Mantini on that uh, recent uh, bird flu uh, research which was uh, uh, carried out uh, in the Netherlands and on which subsequently problems arose like, oh, well, perhaps it's dangerous to publish, should be published uh, uh, at all. And I would like to, if you are interested, and if you do not mind to speak uh, imperfect English, uh, to have a discussion on that, on that uh, issue, yeah, okay. So I, I uh, intend to speak for uh, not longer than 20 minutes, so if you could give me a sign after 20 minutes, then I know where I am, how much time I have. Uh, I would like to start to use that uh, platform. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's one very good thing to go into because we have already learned a lot about that. Um, so I have tried also in today and after yesterday in the December session in Milano uh, to um, order things for myself and, and so I will do for the well. So we talk about uh, Uh, so that's rather quite close to science and technology. 
myself, this may be further for me, but all these things, all the things we do in our life are supported by science and technology, and they do create an enormous amount of different side effects. And very often we also hear the notion of risk. And um, my personal uh, conviction is that we as a society, we have uh, really have risk against us. We lack the appropriate management tools, so to speak, to, uh, to manage, to govern, to contain those risks. Uh, we really lack that, and if you want to go into a, let's say, peaceful, sustainable uh, society, uh, positive society, then we really need to change that and to fix that. And one of the things that we need, which is not sufficient, but I think is necessary for, let's say, managing environmental risks and negative effects, that's life. So that's the first thing I'm going to talk about. Uh, you know, I have uh, slides uh, with, which are available uh, on, on the website of uh, the Barnet. I invite you to go to those slides. But the slides uh, contain a lot of, let's say, fundamental and, and very abstract material. And I have decided for this uh, presentation to strip all abstract fundamental material and to leave only the practical things. And I want to present those to you. And so I skip an enormous law, including ethical principles. They are there and they are very fundamental. So I invite you to have a look at them. I'm not going to discuss them now. I only say that one of the implications of those ethical principles that you will find and the other principles, which is not in the slide, so I say that explicitly to you. You can, as a scientist, I believe, you can even uh, yeah, uh, prove, have a kind of a proof, that those principles that are there on those slides, and which you don't see now, <laughs> but which uh, you can see, are necessary and even sufficient for peaceful coexistence. They are unfortunately not implemented, or not fully implemented, and we have to aim at improving that uh, in order to to be to have a reasonable expectation of a peaceful development of our society. So that is the uh, contention, and one of the implications is that we need much more strict liability laws for risk-generating or harm-generating uh, uh, activities. Uh, so why, why liability? Uh, basically, two reasons. It's ethically fair. So if you, you can apply that to any activity you want. But I apply it, of course, to science and technology-driven activities. But every time you can, you can say, OK, somebody um, engages in an activity that may create a risk for him. Yeah? But the other one has not been asked for his or her consent. Uh, then uh, a negative effect for the others materializes. Yeah? Suppose. At that moment, and you didn't have the consent, then you should be liable. I don't know what the uh, Italian word for liability is. Responsible. And you should be responsible in the sense that you can be required, if asked by a victim, to one, restore, if possible, and two, if not possible, to compensate. Yeah? That's, that's a notion of... So in English they have a, a they have a general word of responsibility, which can mean anything, but they have the, um, the notion liability is a legal one, and which has the meaning which I just said. 
duty to repair, to restore, or to compensate financially. And if you look at uh, both national and international liability laws on environmental issues, then you see enormous gaps. You see amazing, even amazing gaps. So one example, which is not our topic today, is that in uh, international law, for instance, and this is very important for things like Kyoto negotiations, there is no international legal principle of liability for carbon dioxide, which is, for me, something a bit amazing, striking, but it's what it is. Um, so it, it's, it's only fair to have a liability principle and the second one we really need it for this management, for this governance. So those two things. We cannot do without. If we want to continue living without, then you can be sure that is something which is in the last thing, that uh, in, again in a very precise sense, we are together creating more risk and harm generating activities than would be desirable even according to our own values. And, and the point why that can be so, because it sounds paradoxical, it, it can be that is so because we lack the appropriate management instruments, which are collective and one of them again is like this. Uh, so this, this is an example, this is not in biology, but uh, this was a chemical plant in the Netherlands that burned down uh, a year ago. And uh, with the uh, usual uh, environmental effects, uh, the um, direct harm of, let's say, polluted uh, water, namely in the surroundings and, and soil and a few other items, was estimated at uh, 100 million euros. So there were claims to the, uh, the company that managed this thing uh, to the amount of 100 euro, million euros, but the company could not pay uh, because it was already bankrupt in, in the meantime. And they had an insurance policy which uh, uh, went up to 15 million euros and not more. So there is a deficit of uh, 85 million, at least, because no one has tried to calculate or estimate the environmental harm of such a poison, poisonous cloud, of course. It's the out, outside of the picture, so you cannot say how much that is, if you would translate it in money, but you know it's there and it's negative. Uh, and, and this is a very general pattern. You must not think that uh, it's typical for the Netherlands or for this company. No, this is the rule. So what I mean by the rule is that uh, the company engages in a potentially harmful activity, okay? And perhaps it's allowed, then it's allowed. But then, when something happens, then the rule is that there is not enough either their own resources or an insurance policy to cover all the harm. If you think of the uh, also recent uh, BP uh, oil uh, spill in, uh, in America, you all know that, then you, you may know that there was a bill of, uh, well, much more than here in this uh, case, it was about, the bill was in, in the billions of dollars for BP, it was about as much as BP would have been, would it have been twice or ten times uh, that damage, then there would not have been anyone to compensate. For instance, shareholders, I may be a shareholder of the but still I think it's incorrect ethically and from a management perspective that I could not be held to additionally pay if BP's resources would not be have been enough. I think that's unfair, one thing, and if we think that we really can continue uh, in a sustainable way with 
limited liability societies, because that's what I'm talking about. And I think you make a basic error. But an error that I think any scientist can see. So that is, uh, that is the example, but there, is also, there are also uh, GMOs is similar, and perhaps even worse, um, because you see there that there is uh, in fact no, so the in the modified organism, there's crops and that kind of thing, because there is no insurer now in the world who is willing to insure any risk of GMOs. And as a reaction, uh, governments, including the Dutch, I don't know Italian, but Dutch, have said, okay, we are not going to require anything on insurance. Uh, I think you cannot have, that from a management perspective, management of risks from technology, you cannot have that uh, government say, okay, because the insurers say they don't want to insure, we, we uh, uh, yeah. Do not impose that requirement on you. Uh, I think fairly, uh, frankly, I think it should be the other way around. If you cannot find somebody on the earth who wants to insure or be financially uh, responsible in another way, then okay, take that as a sign that it is too dangerous. That's my simple answer to that. And this is very far away from what people. Some people say it's realistic, nevertheless, I keep saying that because, you know, I, I feel like a scientist, yeah, basically. And I, I cannot come to other, other answers, other conclusions than this. So I think it would not be good to say all the things, only because others say that it's not realistic or that. So that is uh, that's the situation. There is also, uh, uh, there are also positive developments. And uh, also scientists can support those kind of developments. That's why I think you need to know them. Uh, this is a second example. It's not really uh, important. This was in the south of Spain. On the left you see a uh, natural uh, area. And there is a mine along the, uh, uh, on that uh, river that you see that. And, and the, a, a dam broke and the river was uh, polluted. Uh, doing uh, ecological harm to the uh, natural area. And then uh, apparently the, uh, the operator, the mining operator, was forced to compensate the harm by developing new environmental uh, area along the shores of that river. And I want to mention that because these kind of things can be uh, Enforced by governments at least via a piece of uh, European legislation, so I, I think that you need to know it for that reason. That's called the uh, European Environmental Liability Directive, it's uh, relatively recent, uh, and that provides a legal framework. Uh, there are uh, all kinds of things to be desired on that piece of uh, law, but in general it's beginning and um, I cannot help thinking that, uh, so it's very weak now to, to, to summarize the few especially big things I can mention in a moment perhaps, but um, you know yesterday um, we had a similar uh, seminar with uh, biologists from uh, Milano, uh, ecologists, I couldn't help thinking that uh, these kind of developments, including the legal people who are supporting them, are a natural coalition of the scientists, because I think they have the same goals. So that's why I think it's important to be aware of that, these developments, and as, as scientific organizations, for instance, to support and to support those uh, legal scientists who are working on it but who are very often not very influential now. So, that is my, my message uh, here. There is also uh, interesting uh, yeah, uh, work for, for uh, biologists. 
because you need to have measures, of course, to say things like, okay, we have a new piece of uh, environment, ecology here, uh, these species, and, and so on, and uh, does it compensate what was lost? So you need uh, uh, something which is a, a merger somehow of biology, uh, ecology, and uh, economics. Those studies are examples of that. It's also interesting to, to know. It's not just a European uh, development because you see that the, uh, the second one there is an American uh, source, and that was the beginning actually. And uh, it began after the Exxon Valdez, yeah, in, in the aftermath of that. So I wanted to uh, let you uh, know that. Yeah, there are also a few uh, uh, weak points. Um, I want to mention especially uh, the two uh, bullets uh, under the uh, point two, which I think are rather fundamental. Uh, the first bullet says that uh, if, if, a, uh, if Italy or the Netherlands or so, uh, they have the uh, possibility, legal possibility, to uh, say that uh, if a company gets a permit for doing certain activities, that they can be exempted from liability. You cannot have this. I think. In, in a sound system of risk management, you cannot have that. So it, there are two things basically. There is the thing that you get a permit to do potentially risky work. Why would you get a permit? Well, because there are also benefits. Yeah. But if you automatically make that an exemption from liability, then things go wrong somewhere. So that's an important uh, hole, so to speak, in this uh, directive, but can be repaired if uh, people uh, want to do that. And if there are sufficiently many people who are convinced of the, of the necessity to support that, uh, and the second one is uh, similar and perhaps even deeper, and that is uh, what is called the um, uh, risk of development. And you see that also in, the, uh, in other pieces of uh, international legislation, like uh, both American and European uh, products like liability law. And it, uh, it comes down to that uh, when at a certain moment you uh, put something into circulation in the market or whatever, substance or, or a GMO or, or whatever. And um, at that moment, I think you cannot have a fundamental perspective of risk management, you cannot have that. So think about that, it's, it's also a deep one. Um, there has been a very fierce discussion the first time when this kind of principle was introduced into Europe, European law, and I think the context then was like, it was uh, uh, products liability law, and so the, there were many people who uh, argued against this exemption, but they lost. They lost, but they were there. So that is what I want to say about uh, liability. Um, So the future is obvious, we need more, more stringent liability uh, regulations. We cannot do, we will never be able to do without uh, regulation up front, which is called ex ante, which comes before the, uh, the act and before the damage. But there is a problem there as well, and, and because of that problem, uh, liability is extra important to have. And, and the that, that problem is that, uh, so it's very difficult to uh, introduce really effective uh, regulation. We have heard a lot of regulation from uh, Julio, and it's there, but very often uh, it's doubtful whether it's really effective. And, and, and why is that? that my reading, at least I want you to, uh, to know this as well, is that if you look at uh, our uh, what is by default allowed in society to do. We talk about technological activities which are potentially harmful. Then um, you have two uh, opposed principles. The 
second one describes what is very often the actual practice. That means that uh, people who engage into potentially harmful activities because they want to make money out of it, but mostly it's that reason, of course, um, then uh, they cannot be stopped legally uh, until somebody has proven that there is a specific risk. And you know, being scientists, that there is an enormous difference between uh, being able to prove that there is a potential risk, for instance, that there is a credible mechanism for something to happen, and between that and proving that the risk is actually there, yes, it's, it's a, a working mechanism. So there is an enormous difference between those two, and that means that uh, you cannot avoid going to that uh, opposite principle, which is sometimes called the cautionary principle, and which says, okay, what is safe again? So that's, um, these are rather fundamental things which uh, I think you uh, will see go very deep into the basics of our legal systems and uh, are not consistent with, uh, let's say, sustainable, peaceful development. So it's quite a, a challenge to uh, change those things, but, uh, well, everything can be changed gradually, but needs action, also from scientists. And, and so, that's why I'm happy that you are here, uh, because that's part of your responsibility to be aware, so you're listening, so you are ready to, to be aware, uh, and perhaps also act, uh, it's not on the slide, I think, but, uh, I think, yes, that you can say that uh, scientific organizations also can be said to have a moral obligation to actively engage in the relevant political, uh, political uh, discussions. I heard frequently the word politics in your uh, talk. I was not sure uh, what exactly you meant, but yeah, I think, yes, uh, scientists cannot be neutral need to uh, be uh, politically active in this sense, at this level. So, um, yeah, um, there is the last oh, 10 minutes here, so then I want to use those last 10 minutes for my uh, last topic, because, uh, so then I go back to uh, this part, so I think that I have now scientific group of Professor Fouchier, that's in the medical department in uh, Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And um, he, he demonstrated that, uh, so the bird flu, which comes from Asia a couple of years ago, you know, I think, what I'm talking about. This is the scientific name. That, uh, um, in its current uh, uh, state, Humans are not uh, susceptible uh, because you need to do two things. Uh, you need to uh, change the virus, which can, of course, occur naturally. Uh, it must be changed in such a way that it is harmful for people. It's one thing. And it turned out that it was relatively easy. If I understand, it was easy to do that, to modify it, which also means that it can be easy that it occurs naturally. And the second one is that you need to make it airborne. So it needs to be uh, transferred through the air. Otherwise you do not infect people, at least not on a large scale. 
And it also turned out that that is very easy. So they very easily uh, changed the virus, infected a fret, that's uh, an animal that's used apparently uh, very often for these kind of things. It's a mammal, not relevant what it is. And when they put them in a cage with a double uh, yeah, closure, which only which excludes uh, direct contact, then the other one gets infected as well. So that was the proof, because frets are models for humans in this case. That was the experiment. Now and then, what I want to talk about, um, to mention, is there was a, a big problem immediately, a, a big stir, uh, lots of discussion, uh, should the research be published or not? If you publish it, then uh, it can be used in a beneficial way to uh, suppose that this mutation occurs naturally and to help uh, experts to uh, develop uh, vaccines. Uh, but is or is it too dangerous? Because you can, if you know that, I mean, you can use it uh, for uh, malicious uh, causes as well. Um, one of the interesting things for me is to, to notice that, in a sense, the um, scientific and non-scientific world were unprepared. It, it was a bit of a stir. Yeah. So. Uh, what happened was that the advice of an American uh, scientific advisory board, as an EPD, was asked. Initially, they said, okay, no, not published. Uh, and after that, they returned that. And now, as uh, Julius said, it has been published. Um, a very interesting thing is that the Dutch government and officials also uh, came into play because they uh, at least threatened to use one of those export uh, regulations which Julie mentioned to block uh, publication because they said publication of knowledge is the same as exporting it. Yeah? It was very, well, in, in, in a sense, funny. But, you know, what is interesting is that, as I said, we are almost not prepared for these things. Whereas we know for a long time that they will happen and will increasingly happen. I have two questions for you. I have two questions for you. And the first one is that, uh, okay, in this case, the uh, senior researcher, he was uh, embarrassed and upset that somebody wanted to block publication because he is thinking very much out of the sense of scientific freedom. And scientific freedom implies two things. Freedom to research whatever you think is interesting. Yeah? And second, to publish anything you found and think is interesting. And he saw the second one blocked. And he was in fact, uh, yes, embarrassed, upset. Uh, and so my two questions are, first one, would you also be upset? So we talk about scientific freedom freedom to uh, investigate any topic you want, freedom to publish anything you want. And uh, so some people say there are limits to that. Uh, so there are external factors to science, for instance, a weighing of risks of uh, malevolent use, which uh, would lead to, uh, to a decision that uh, Scientists should not or cannot research certain topics or that they can 